Now, many of you will be familiar with the phrase, we have achieved much, but there is still so much more to do. And our first session this evening is going to allow us to reflect not only on where we have been, but where we hope to get to in our future. Our speakers are transformative leaders in their fields. Fabrice Houdar, Managing Director Out Leadership, Rudani Chetri, Managing Trustee and Project Manager for Me to Trust, and our moderator for this evening, Nancy Kelly, CEO of Stonewall. Let us now join them as we peek into the future of LGBT plus inclusion. Nancy, over to you. Welcome everybody to this session at RISE, which is called Gazing into a Crystal Ball, the Future of LGBTQ Inclusion. Uh, my name is Nancy, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm the Chief Executive of Stonewall. And first, I really want to say thank you to RISE for the inv invitation to kind of moderate this panel. It's a, going to be a real pleasure for me uh, to be able to kind of hear the insights that Fabrice and Radrani are going to be able to bring to today's conversation. Um, and I'm going to hand over first to Fabrice and Radrani to kind of introduce themselves briefly and their work and then I've got some kind of reflections on the last 10 years and then we'll move into some kind of conversation around how things are now for LGBTQ people and how things are going to look in the future. So Fabrice, uh, welcome and it would be wonderful if you could introduce yourself and your work to the people that are joining us today. Well thank you so much Nancy and uh, it's such a pleasure to be with you and Rudrani uh, you know, I have a huge weakness for uh, India. And uh, and so, you know, I'm very sorry about the toll that COVID is taking uh, on the place. You know, I first uh, went to New Delhi in 2012, sent by the World Bank to look at the uh, socioeconomic experience of sexual minorities. And, uh, you know, it, it kind of turned my life around because it ended up being my job when, when I was an economist at the bank before. So I am very grateful to India, but I also fell in love with the place and, and you know, I have very close friends uh, uh, there. And so uh, it, it's, it's such a pleasure to be with uh, Pride Circle. Um, so I'll tell you very briefly about me. For 14 years, I was at the World Bank. It was way too long. Uh, but then I managed to escape, uh, you know, uh, right after I, I, I worked a lot on the cost of homophobia and the socioeconomic outcomes of sexual minorities and the link to development. And so the next natural step was I went to work for the High Commissioner on Human Rights on a campaign called Free and Equal, which goal is to, mm -hmm. you know, kind of affect social attitudes. And, uh, and then when I was there, I ended up kind of becoming a bit of an expert on how to engage the private sector on those issues. You know, the power of the private sector is huge, mm -hmm. but very often they are very happy to get the benefit of looking good on LGBT issues mm -hmm. and do as little as possible uh, to contribute to social change. And so now I left, after four years, I left the office of the High Commissioner and I work for a small shop called Out Leadership that has about 84 member companies. And, um, and you know, a, a big part of my job is to talk to those companies about what's happening in the world and then try to find opportunities for them to contribute. And then uh, as I was mentioning to you before the call, now I focus a lot on, a, on, a, on kind of a niche topic which is ensuring that LGBTQ plus people are represented on corporate boards. And actually that can be something we discuss about when we talk about the future of inclusion. Uh, but, but that's, that's in short what I, uh, uh, what my uh, work life is about. It's fantastic. I love that you're an escaped economist. I like the idea of economists being able to escape being economists. Rudrani, it's fantastic to be able to have you with us today. And it would be great to just have an introduction to you and your work for people that are joining us in this session. Uh, thank you so much uh, for giving me this opportunity. And so my name is Rudrani. I self-identify myself as a transgender person, transgender woman. And I'm based in Delhi, but I do work all across India. And... I founded Delhi's first community-based organization in year 2005. Since then, I've been working with community, but uh, as I've been identified as, you know, I've been not, I, I've been labeled as, you know, a transgender activist, but how I identify myself is very differently is I identify myself as an artist. Mm -hmm. And I believe that uh, LGBT people are always seen with, you know, very, you know, sorry faces and 
that uh-huh. they cannot do something really good in life. But I I believe there's so much in trans community and LGBT community. So I identify myself as an artist, and I started India's first transgender modeling agency. And after that, uh, com- we have been as a community been able to do a couple of you know things with the entertainment industry. And I've recently done three films and. Yes, this is who I am <laughs> till now. I think that's incredible. And I really think it's powerful the way, Rudrani, that you're pointing to the way that the outside world identifies as, oh, you know, this is a trans activist or this is an a LGBT activist. And actually what we are is, you know, parents and friends and artists and even escaped economists. I think that's kind of a, it's a really kind of powerful insight there. I guess before I pass on to the questions, and I'm on the team at Pride Circle, were kind of kind enough to ask me something, uh, something kind of impossible, which is what I think of the last 10 years, last decade. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give an inadequate answer, but maybe ho- hopefully something that frames our discussion today a little bit. It feels to me glo- globally like we're at the point of, of kind of great possibility, but also great tension around LGBTQ rights. So. You know, if I think about the last 10 years, you've seen incredible progress on kind of core human rights issues in a lot of national contexts. You know, so around things like decriminalization of homosexuality or workplace rights or these sorts of things. And and you've also seen in a lot of national contexts, very positive shifts in public attitudes, you know, greater visibility of our communities, more acceptance of our communities. But we've also in some places seen things go backwards, often quite rapidly. So quite close to to me here in the UK, for instance, we've seen the position in Poland over the last four years change really rapidly from a very inclusive country to a place with LGBT free zones. Right. And we're all of us, I think, in the middle of figuring out how to um, kind of organize and fight back against a global anti-trans movement that's targeting our trans siblings around the world. So I guess my reflection is it's a real time for solidarity across our movement globally, and also for building and trusting in very transformative dynamic partnerships. So with other liberation movements, kind of women's rights movement, racial justice movement, all of these things but also with kind of allies and supporters in public and private sectors around the world. So some of the work that we at Stonewall do, or Fabrice was talking to around bringing together all of these powerful actors uh, kind of in support of LGBTQ rights. Because I think there is all of this potential, but also so, so many of our siblings still not being able to kind of live their fullest lives. So, so kind of, I think that when I look forward or backwards, that's how I see it. But Bruce, I, want, I kind of want to come to you first and, and maybe to continue some of the themes around the role of business. And, and what, what is it that you think global businesses should be focusing on in the next 10 years for them to play a really meaningful part in advancing LGBTQ rights? Uh, thanks, Nancy. You know, I, I kind of love your overview, which is that uh, you know, we are, as you know, we are at a weird time in, in human history, you know, one of those transition points, right? Both economic and, and geopolitical. And, and so the natural tendency of politicians, as you pointed out in the case of Poland, is to go back to the oldest trick in the book, which is you take a group of people and you say, no, no, don't look at the fact that your life is not satisfying. Look at those people. You know, those are the people that are destroying families, they are destroying tradition, they are the problem, right? And uh, and so uh, that kind of paralyzed politicians. And and you pointed out the gigantic progress that we have known in the past ten years. And sometimes governments did play a significant role. You know, think about as an example, Hillary Clinton at the State Department saying, you know, LGBT rights are human rights. We are going to focus our foreign policy on it. Well, what I think is that governments are going to be a little bit captured by this populism trend. And so we have to find new allies and new strategy to continue social change. Because as you mentioned, you know, mostly the people that benefited from social change are people like me, right? The 
the middle class, upper middle class white gay guy that managed to make a place for himself under the sun. You know, I have, I, I, as we discussed previously, I have a family, things that I could never dream of when I came out. And so I reap the benefits. But the vast majority of our sisters and brothers still don't have access to dignity and opportunity. And in a connected world, that's a huge problem because you cannot tell people in uh, Chennai, oh, you know, don't worry, your time will come. In two generations, there will be a happy, fulfilled lesbian woman in Chennai. But for now, just accept that your life is going to be shitty and it's not going to be what you were expecting. You know, you cannot do that in a connected world. That person knows that in another environment, she would be entitled to a life of dignity and opportunity. So we have to accelerate the pace of social change. I don't think that the private sector is, you know, going to uh, contribute, going to be the driver of social change, but it can contribute. And in many ways, you know, something that Stan Wall has pointed out, you know, many times in the report is that businesses want to be pro-LGBT because that's such an easy way for them to say, look, I'm a good guy. I'm on, I'm on the right side of the equation. I, you know, I am uh, pro-trans. I am pro-LGBTQ uh, 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 plus youth. Look, I'm a good guy. Buy my product. And so what I work on is how can we make that work for the community? You know, okay, you want the pro-LGBT label, we are going to give it to you, but we need things in exchange because we're suffering. And so I think that that's why we need to focus on, you know, find that sweet spot in which the private sector can be an ally to our community in a way that makes our lives better uh, abroad. I really, I really like Fabrice how you talked about the kind of the way in which our world is interconnected. So that means that LGBTQ people everywhere have got kind of got a vision of their own free lives, and they want to strive towards it. And I think for us as a movement, coming together to make that possible feels really important. And, and, and if I may add, that's a, that's a big change because when I came out, I didn't know that I was entitled to a life of dignity and opportunity. Yeah. But yeah. now people my age, all around the world, they know that they have a right to a life of dignity and opportunity. Yeah. I'm interested, Rudrani, in kind of what you've seen change in the last decade in India and your own reflections of, of what it means to be part of the LGBTQ community and how that has shifted in the last decade. Okay. So as I, 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 I always say, I, I a lot of time go to this universities and college where I speak to young kids and they really want to understand, you know, half of my life, which they may not be aware. They can only, you know, read certain things, which interview sort of thing. But uh, uh, I say I am somebody who's not totally, you know, analog and somebody who's totally digital. So I've seen two different, you know, set up where a trans person being, uh, you know, as an LGBTQ person, you know, at least giving, getting this acknowledgement that you, you do it from a time where I was totally invisible. I, or I was a person that nobody wanted to interact with, you know, within community, though we regret for a lot of things, which is not same as, as, you know, earlier as a, as a community. Also, I used to say that as a LGBT community, we used to have a very close connection. Now it is not so much because we mm -hmm. have been able to, you know, get along with the general community, which mm -hmm. quote unquote, people used, you used to say like, you know, normal and not abnormal people. It's not the same way. It's, you know, I am LGBT person, you know, I'm a trans person and my, my neighbor is cis, heterosexual, male or female person. And we talk. It, mm -hmm. it wasn't the same. So I have seen change and I think credit goes to community for it, not one individual or, you know, one, one you know, self-identifying activist or label activist or some, you know, some star, a big person, but I think each and every individual who came out openly or, or who were, who was able to talk about, you know, he, her, he, them, whatever they felt like. So I think this is the change I see now. A lot of people are so proud to be, you know, who they are. Usually that situation. I think that's, that's 
so heartening and so inspiring. But I also think that it picks up themes that I think a lot of us have experienced. So increasing acceptance, but also is that a loss of community? And how do we kind of maintain the really strong, mutually supportive bonds with other LGBTQ people as the world kind of becomes less hostile? So it's, a, it's kind of a, it's a strange, it's a strange change, isn't it? As well as a very beautiful one, I think. But Breeze, I think a lot of people that are kind of in the session will be really interested in the kinds of internal challenges that global organisations face when they commit to LGBT inclusion. So kind of what makes it difficult, what gets in the way of these big global actors really kind of committing to making change for our communities? Yeah, and, and you know, um, I think you wouldn't, you won't be surprised uh, Nancy, to think, I think the, the, the issue is authenticity, you know, mm. because um, because we have made it impossible, particularly in the West, but, you know, increasingly in places like uh, Mumbai or we have made it impossible for people to be openly homophobic mm. and transphobic. Mm. You know, I mean, the UK, in, in, indeed, in the in the media, there is a transphobic vocal movement. Yeah. But you know what I mean? In the workplace, people are very cautious. It doesn't mean that they are more accepting. It doesn't mean that they don't believe that LGBTQ plus inclusion is a bullshit topic, right? Yeah. And so I think that sometimes the mistake we make is we think that because the homophobic and transphobic voices in the workplace are much more silent, that the homophobia and the transphobia are gone. And so, you know, every time I talk to a company and they're like, oh, you know, we set up our employee resource group, um, you know, where should we start? And, you know, I, I say, A, you know, tone at the top is very important mm -hmm. because, you know, when the, the CEO or when the senior management say, no, 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 this is not a bullshit topic. This is something that is serious. It's really about the well-being of our employees. Then, you know, people pay more attention. And then the other thing is individual story of employees. That's a game changer because the way we are discriminated against our suffering in the workplace can be very subtle, you know, in, in, in ways that are difficult for, to comprehend for people that are not there. You know, we were joking about the fact that I was a rather unhappy economist at the, at the World Bank. I spent 10 years feeling that I was from an inferior species. You know what I mean? Like the mm -hmm. short, uh, the short gay guy, right? That 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 doesn't have much to contribute, and is is kind of an inferior, you know, a beta male, right? And it took me a long time to come back to that and to feel that my voice mattered as much as the voice of other people. And you know, sharing that, that's kind of you know, people are like, why is he talking about such very personal things? But it is important for colleagues to understand. Mm -hmm what is our experience and you know that's true for any minorities you know that's true for Dalit people in India that's true for Batwa people in Congo that's true for Roma people in Europe is that if you are if you have never walked in those shoes it is very difficult to comprehend what is the experience and so uh so I think that's what the the, the real bottleneck is uh, to me Nancy is that when we get to that point where homophobic and transphobic voices feel that they cannot be too vocal about their homophobia and transphobia, but it is still there, you know. And how do you how do you open this conversation so that so that it disappears? It's interesting what you're saying about kind of how hidden, particularly in the big global corporations, that kind of homophobia, transphobia can be. I was having a, a conversation with a very senior out gay man who works in banking yesterday. And one of the things that he was saying is you can look at, um, you can look at these big global banks and if you look at how many LGBT people there are, it looks good. But then you realise that all of the LGBT people work in support services or they work in legal and none of them work in the kind of banking side of the business. And it was a really interesting conversation to think about the subtle ways you get kind of role segregations within these companies and status segregations within these companies that from the outside aren't so visible, but are kind of profoundly influencing the experience of being LGBTQ in, in that organization. 
I love it, Nancy. And I have to tell you, when I was at the United Nations, you didn't have any out assistant secretary general. And God knows we have many assistant secretary general. And I think the message is like, you know, gay people are welcome as long as they keep their place, you know. But but in decision making, in the serious place, we're not going to put them there, right? And so I love what you say, which is, you know, you have to look at the granular um, aspect of representation. Yeah. So kind of... You were talking, Rodrani, earlier about your work as an artist and someone with a lot of experience within creative industries in India. And I'm interested in what you think some of the biggest challenges LGBTQ people face in the creative industries and kind of what you think the, the pathway to change is for, for, for artists and creatives kind of working in your context. Okay, so... Um... I think, I mean, it's very recent where, you know, where I've seen actually the real people from the community, uh, they have started, you know, getting jobs as an actor, as an artist, mm -hmm. or, you know, they somebody now have started believing, that, you know, they are not only good enough for doing sex work or, you know, begging thing, but they have more, more, you know, in them. But the difficult part is it is so limited. It's it's so very limited. And, you know, it, India is a big country. And I believe the consumer for the entertainment is, you know, it, it's, it's a big, big number. But when it, it is about the representation, I think a uh, lot of time it is misrepresentation because mm -hmm. when entertainers want to sell themselves, they want to spice up things a little bit, you know, so that you know, people are more interested and sometimes, a lot of time, people are interested in nonsense stuff because their life is so serious, all you know, it's so serious, they just want to get out of this serious life and they want to look something, you know, stupid or maybe funny according to them but what happens if it actually mis misrepresents communities yeah. and at the time where is there is a need to not only talk about communities in sense of, you know, their artists, but to also give them the real picture of, you know, who communities are and what their needs and what their demand. For example, for last 10 years or 15 years, or, you know, I can recall, I've only seen a trans person acting as a sex worker who yeah. do have very, you know, sad life where she gets beaten up and, and, and you know, she gets murdered. In my last film also, I was one of the victims where, you know, I get murdered. <laughs> Uh, I was a sex worker, but there was also a good part in the film that I, I was somebody who was looking care of a little girl who was orphan and, you know, she was just trying to survive by her, her own. So I think when you go and talk to communities like us who really want to be actor, or, you know, what is our real life? I think that change has to come. It's not only about the trans, you know, trans woman person, but it is for everyone that may be, you know, L, B, you know, T, G, by N number of people. And we really need that. So at present, at least there is some kind of, you know, easiness and relaxation within the community, you know, in journal that they are actually, okay, they, they, they are looking at us and they are appreciating us. But I think this is, this will take a bit more time. And mm -hmm. what we need to do is what we have started we need to maintain it. If we feel mm -hmm. something is offending, as in, not only as an artist, as in, as in journal community, if you do understand about LGBT community, as a friend and supporter, I think you need to voice for it. And you have to say that this is wrong. You need to correct it. And I think this is how we're going to create, you know, mm -hmm. not only space for LGBT community, but we're going to, you know, make them as artists or any anyone who they want to be. I think um, when you were talking, I was thinking so much as well about the um, disclosure doc that was made about the representation of trans people in, in films globally. And I think what was interesting to me hearing, hearing you talk about the experience of trans actors in India is actually that's the same for trans actors everywhere and very much kind of came out through that documentary, the way in which the kind of presentation of trans people you know you can like as you say you can be a sex worker and you can die or it can be about kind of some horror about your body and I, I think that it makes me think about through my lifetime 
you know, as I was growing up, there was some visibility of lesbians, particularly of gay men, lesbians still not much visibility in public media. But again, it was all kind of sensationalized. It was hypersexual. It was, you know, it's d difficult and it's sad. And, you know, you never saw kind of just gay people being teachers or whatever. And it, that's only just starting to change now. And I think in Western media, you're only just starting to see kind of mainstream representations of LGBTQ people just being people. It seems to just take a really long time to shift that that kind of that quite oppressive, I guess, set of stories about us. I, I, I believe I believe it's not only the misrepresentation part, but it's also about, you know, not treating them like as 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 the documentary you were talking about. It's, it's also not, you know, treating one individual as equal as other, yeah. you know, in spite of he or she being, you know, even more, you know, talented than the other one, just because of your preferred gender and sexuality. And one of the main thing which I have, you know, personally, you know, gone through and my friends do get very upset about it, you know, most of the time, because they say, you know, the, the companies which approach to me, the brands which approach to me, or, you know, any tag which approach, which they believe that I should not be getting paid for my time. Mm -hmm. And I'm the worst person, you know, asking money to someone because I've been working as an activist and I've been surviving by, you know, doing small little things for myself. So sometimes I see, you know, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating some kind of resources or some kind of training material for, you know, coming generation who really want to get into it. That's why I, I don't, I think this is what I'm getting paid. This is how I, I'll be getting paid when somebody tomorrow will say, no, I just want to be an actor because I've seen Radrani acting so well and real. So I think this is what my payment, but the, the besides that fact, that's very emotional and that is what I believe. But when people don't treat you the same way, they, they see yeah. as, you know, they're doing big favor by, you know, taking you in, casting you and uh, giving you this opportunity. And they, they'll, you know, make you feel that your entire community is evil and enemy and they will, you know, mm -hmm. take it away. This shouldn't be the case. I think people should be treated equally. It's not only the payment, but the in respect in other ways also. I think it kind of ties for me back to some of the conversations as well that we've been having with Fabrice about kind of big global businesses. So also at Stonewall, we work with, with big global businesses and actually they can do a lot of leading work in terms of how they do their advertising in different contexts. And, you know, I, um, you can see some really groundbreaking work it, done by big companies. And I think there's, there's a lot to be said for, um, organizations like Fabrice and mine kind of pushing these global corporations to invest in paying LGBTQ creatives in their supply chain. So not only showing LGBTQ stories, but also just paying people like you to do your job, you know, irrespective of what the story is and kind of changing the market for creative services and uh, changing the kind of position that LGBTQ people can have in public life. I definitely think um, that's one of the things that that can kind of start to sort of change or shift the narratives you're pointing to. I just gave myself a job to do, which I always manage to do whenever I have a conversation with anybody. Well, well and Nancy, I love, I, I also love what you, you're, you're discussing with Rudrani because it also applies to transgender people in the workplace. You know, a lot of the time, so, you know, there is not that many trans people that have made it to the gigantic yeah. corporations, you know, I mostly work with, but very often it doesn't go very well. And the reason mm -hmm. is because the corporation feel, you know, you should be lucky I gave you a job. You know what I mean? And after a while, the trans person, after a year or so, they're like, you know, it's nice to have a job, but I would like to have a career like everybody else, yeah. right? I don't want yeah. to be the token, yeah. the token trans people that should be grateful to have a job. You know, I want you to invest in me. I want you to provide me the support I, I, I you know, necessary for me to succeed in the workplace. And so I, I, I you know, what Rudrani says really echoes to me, my experience with trans people in the workplace, which is, well, I gave you a job. You should be grateful. Now let's move on. And people are like, no, no, no. The job is the beginning. Now I would like a career. I want to be included. I want to be 
on that track to be in front of business, not just in the back doing, you know, the reception, receptionist work. And, um, and, and that's kind of fascinating, right? Which is that, 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 you know, it, it all comes back to, to what Rudrani said, which is the commonality of our human experience, which is all we want is exactly the same that other people get, which is a shot at a life of dignity and opportunity. You know, we are not asking for more. We're just asking for the exact same thing. You know, look beyond our sexual orientation, look beyond our gender identity, so that we have the same chance to be in senior management, so that we have the same chance to be a successful actor, so that we have the same chance to be uh, on the corporate board. I love it. I feel like it's such a pleasure talking to both of you about these things and all of the connections between them. I want to kind of like return with both of you really to the idea of kind of building partnerships for change and kind of the idea that making change isn't kind of the responsibility of an act just one activist as Radrani was pointing to or an industry or human rights organizations uh, you know it's about it's about you know coalitions and partnerships of people moving and working together and um, I kind of am interested in hearing kind of your reflections of where you've seen partnerships or movement building really work. I think for, for me, we're involved at the minute in the UK in St at Stonewall in what we're kind of halfway through a campaign to ban conversion therapy, which are kind of practices that are seeking to change somebody's gender identity or uh, or their sexuality, which we know are incredibly harmful and kind of UN experts have, have said are close to torture. And we haven't quite got there yet, but we've got the UK government to commit publicly to legislating to a ban, which has been a long road. But that has I know been you, really... I, I noticed you put huge pressure on them and, and good yeah. for you. <laughs> We're going to keep going until we've got what we need. But I think one of the things that's made that partnership really work is you have kind of grassroots activists on conversion therapy working with all of the big kind of human rights NGOs like like Stonewall and with um, all of the medical bodies so psychological uh, organizations and doctors organizations and also with uh, liberal faith community leaders so you've got kind of psychotherapists and doctors saying this shouldn't happen you've got faith leaders saying this shouldn't happen and you've got organizations like ours and you've got activists and we are all saying exactly the same thing and we're saying it together and I think that solidarity has made it much harder for um for the government to kind of to pick us off one by one and to say you know and to pit us against each other and I think that degree of kind of collectiveness and solidarity isn't always e easy to achieve but when you achieve it it can be quite transformational I don't know um maybe Fabrice do you do you have some examples of where you think kind of partnership has worked really well around LGBTQ rights yeah you know I, I'll tell you first of all everything that you described in the UK we kind of have the same experience within the US you know um and, and, and something that I love that you kind of mentioned at the beginning of our talk, which is you, you were talking about the intersectionality of movements, right? And, you know, the, the racial equity movement, uh, you know, the gender equality movement. You know, one of the things that, that, that I think we have to do is to have to learn from other movements. Yeah. And, 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 you know, one thing that I really discovered in the racial equality movement in the United States is that first racism took different forms all the time, right? And so that means our journey is far from over mm. because, you know, slavery was, was re replaced by Jim Crow. Jim Crow was replaced by mass incarceration. It has taken uh, uh, many forms, which, you know, shows that we have to be vigilant. And one of the biggest risks that we have in the West is uh, uh, basically coming to the belief that our fight is over when it is far from over, right? And then the other thing that, that you know, I have an experience lately about a bill, I won't, I won't really mention which one, but it's a bill in which other minorities are represented, but our minority is not included. And, 
and and the message from the politician is you guys have to wait you know gender identity is too scary to be included in the bill it will never pass and you have to wait and i think that you know it, it to me it was a reminder that i need to work with the latino mm -hmm. i need to work with people of color i need to work with women i need to work with people that are disabled i need to work with veterans so that we come to the understanding that our fight is a joint fight right it is not um it is not we are not all uh, fighting in silos and you know when i think about india the fate of dalit people the new gender equality agenda you know which is completely you know in many ways untouched right where that there is so much that has to be done those sh should be movements that are working together because very often we were convinced by the opposition that sexual orientation and gender identity was a different question right oh it's really it's about sex so it, you know it's different but really it's the older story in the book which is yeah. people that say i'm going to take the entire pie and you're going to get nothing because of who you worship because of the color of your skin because of uh you know which tribe you belong to you know what i mean it is the older story in the book there's nothing particular about discrimination against lgbt people it is the same discrimination against dalit people it's the same discrimination mm -hmm. against women against batwa people in congo against roma people in europe it is the same story and mm -hmm. therefore we constantly need to find bridge with other oppressed minorities because we're fighting the same fight which is a fight for fairness in which people that have taken the entire pie now we should put pressure on them to be like no 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 you need you need to give us our fair share of the pie i think a lot when you when you were speaking um i talk a lot about there's a great quote from a uh, black woman civil rights leader fanny lou hamer and she said nobody's free till everybody's free and i think about that a lot you know the idea that that all of these fights for liberation and justice are inter deeply interconnected and so unless we're kind of standing together and standing for each other none of us will kind of succeed on our own terms i think in the end so just to kind of briefly finish i'm interested to hear from both of you what you what you hope the future looks like in india for lgbtq people and globally for lgbtq people i'll start with you with you radrani when you look forward what do, what do you want that future to look like for the communities um, i face a lot of difficulties trust me so <laughs> but i'm at, at the same time very optimistic i have seen you know some very beautiful changes in personal life and you know people whom i work with and though this all uh, has been still yet not very easy for a lot mm -hmm. of us till date it is not easy but i see a better future i see better future because i see you know now there is acceptance in sense like people who may not identify themselves as you know lgbt people but they are willing to listen and you know and talk to and interact so i think for a very long time what happened was there was a communication gap they may be different mm -hmm. reason for this communication gap because this is how people were conditioned to hate trans and you know lgbt people and lgbt people thinking you know that you know we should not be talking about ourselves because we'll get in trouble but i believe now as things have changed you know we have seen some beautiful relationship which is of acceptance i think mm -hmm. and and the amount of work everybody is you know doing and you know trying to make this better place it may be lesser in number but i think that all are doing a fabulous job i think even somebody who may be you know listening to something like this or you know similar conversation like this i think they should be very you know optimistic and very you know seeing that this future to be bright because if me not you know i can imagine somebody of same my age you know 15 20 years or 30 years ago what she may you know must have been going through at that time i i really am not sure but i think today i own my own house i do have my family i i'm still connected with my biological family so 
I think it's a better future. It is going to be a better future for everyone and it has to be. We will make it a better future for everyone. There is no turning back. I love that. I absolutely love that. Fabrice, what, what does the future like? Do you, you have to follow the incredible Radrani, which is dreadful yeah, I know. for you. But you know, I was kind of thinking... What do you say? I was kind of thinking that Rudrani is the opposite of uh, of a middle-aged uh, Frenchman. You know, middle-aged Frenchmen tend to be uh, uh, very negative, and um, you know, Indian transwoman they see the they see the silver lining and the and the 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 beauty. And I was, you know, when I was listening to her, I I, I was thinking the same thing. You know, I have a, I'm renting a small house. I have two boys that I'm incredibly happy about. I have a job, I have health insurance. Many things I didn't think that I would get, I, you know, I got in life. And, and for the first time, I have a little bit of a feeling of like, things are going to be okay. And, you know, I, you know, I think I need to celebrate that, that there is progress. But, but, you know, you and I discussed at the beginning about the effort that Stanwall is making on mental health. And I think it's very important because the suffering of our community is real. You know, uh, in A meetings in the US, you see so many gay people, right? And besides addictions, you have the issue of depression, which is gigantic in our community, right? And also the issue of lack of meaning sometimes in life. And that suffering, you know, we have no responsibility on, in it. it. It's imposed in us, you know? We should have, we shouldn't have those disproportionate negative mental health outcome because of the prejudice of society. And so the future, I think, for us is not only to survive, you know what I mean? Not only to avoid dying of AIDS or dying of, of you know, an early uh, a brutal death or dying of suicide. It is to strive and to be happy, right? And, and suffering for our community for too long has been a mandatory rite of passage. But what I see in the future is a seven-year-old that is attracted to other boys or a seven-year-old that is attracted to, to other girls, you know, to the same sex. And instead of being a sad story where, you know, it's an obstacle course in which that person has to, has to prevail despite the dragon that she has to slay, you know, what I think is that we will have achieved our goal when that seven-year-old, you know, for that seven-year-old, happiness will be the, the, the norm, right? It will be a life of happiness and fulfilling their potential rather than a life of hardship and suffering. And so that's what I see for us in the future, is that being, being, having a same-sex attraction or having a non-conforming gender identity would not be a factor in your happiness. I, lo I, I love what both of you said so much. And I, I've been privileged recently to, to help Stonewall develop its new strategy, um, which we're going to launch soon. But... But at the at the start of the strategy is about our vision. And I think that's really it's really important to me. And it's a vision of a world in which LGBTQ people everywhere are free to live their lives to the fullest, you know, not just to avoid suffering, not just to get by, not just to be accepted, but to be celebrated to, you know, to be joyful and to kind of live in our fullest and in, in our fullest selves. And I think that like like for me, as Rodrani was pointing to, this kind of generational change piece is gives me so much hope. You know, the experience of LGBTQ elders, as we've all been kind of talking about, was so different to the experience that, that we're having. And then we do some work and we open some doors and we make some change some change in our lives so that LGBTQ children and the generations that come after us get to have more space, more freedom, keep thriving. And I think each generation of our community has the power to transform the lives of the generations that come after us. And I feel really kind of grateful to my elders and I feel really kind of responsible to kind of my younger LGBTQ families to be part of that kind of positive change in the world. So I, you know, I just, I have, I just want to say thank you to both of you. I have found it both fascinating and incredibly uplifting, actually, to spend some time uh, kind of listening to your thoughts. Uh, um, thank you so much to Pride Circle for giving us all the opportunity to spend some time together today. Um, I hope for people that are taking part in the session that you found things that 
you know, help you think and that kind of challenge you around what you're going to do to uh, kind of improve the experiences of LGBTQ people in the community in India or wherever you live. So I just want to say thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Nancy. Just such a pleasure uh, being with you this morning. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy, Fabrice and Rajrani for such an insightful session. There was so much that resonated, especially about the power of storytelling, of telling our own stories inside and outside of the workplace and our power as community to utilize all of our talents so that we no longer just survive, but that we thrive. 